Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to a Game of Thrones in World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. You know, I was a little bit dubious as to whether or not to actually include this as an episode of the Game of Thrones, because, well, I mean, one of the teams definitely throws, but it's it's not entirely due to anything that they did wrong. It, You know what, you be the judge. Wait until you've seen the home battle, and then let me know what you think. This is a three-ship division, so we do actually have a multiple perspective battle for you today. Uh, we have Malangor 2024 in the USS North Carolina, although we're not going to be seeing much of him today. Next, we have Theseus Raholan here. Theseus in the Tier 8 Japanese heavy cruiser, the Anago. This is the Black Friday edition. Theseus, of course, named himself after the legendary Greek hero who slew the Gorgon Medusa and also rescued Andromeda from the Kraken. But we're going to start off today's battle from the perspective of the third member of the division. This is Taran 456 in the USS Yorktown. And we're switching to his perspective at the start because, well, he actually gets to see and do stuff because he's in an aircraft carrier. He can spot, cover the entire map within the first minute while everybody else is still getting up to full speed. You often see aircraft carriers doing this, by the way, right at the start of the battle dump an aircraft from the attack flight. The reason they do this is those aircraft immediately return to the carrier and are ready to go again. So you can basically have a full squadron again ready to go as soon as you've gotten these initial spots off. But let's talk about that initial spotting. So he's already detected. Somebody can see his aircraft but he can't see any enemy ships. Which seems a bit weird. You'd think that, you know, a great big warship belching smoke would be easier to spot than a small flight of aircraft cruising at altitude, but, well, there's very little basis in reality for the way things like aircraft carriers and submarines work in this game. Aircraft spotting has been nerfed steadily over the years since the aircraft carrier rework, so it's not unusual for the aircraft to be spotted. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing, by the way, because it was 100% out of control immediately following the aircraft carrier rework, so some form of nerf to aircraft spotting did need to happen. But we're going to see just how little difference it's made. <laughs> how many ships has he spotted? Seven. So more than half the enemy team. There's eight. Remember, there's only 12 of them. There's ten. <laughs> so the only things he hasn't spotted, without losing a single aircraft, are the destroyer and the submarine. And I think we can tell... Yeah, there's the destroyer as well. <laughs> so... <laughs> so, it's a fairly good start uh, for Taran in the USS Yorktown. The thing is, even if he gets the aircraft shot down, it's not going to make any difference, because four of them have safely returned to the carrier, and the other four, to make up the full squadron, will have replenished by now. So, yep, there we go, back to the carrier. He's got three full squadrons of aircraft once again ready to go. So how about those spotting nerfs? <laughs> yeah... Oh well, never mind. The only thing on the enemy team he hasn't already spotted is the submarine. Which is kind of ironic if you stop and think about it, because the single most effective way of spotting submarines during World War II, the single most effective countermeasure to submarines were patrol aircraft. I mean, these aren't patrol aircraft, these are dive bombers. But still, it makes you think, doesn't it? And then, there's the enemy submarine as well! <laughs> Wow! <laughs> now, the Yorktown's aircraft are kind of unusual. The first squadron of aircraft that he launched, the Torpedo Bombers, the Douglas Sky Raiders, those are the only aircraft squadrons this carrier can launch that are capable of conducting multiple strikes. They can, in theory, conduct up to four attacks from the same squadron. The other two squadrons, the dive bombers, these hell divers, and the rocket attack aircraft, the tactical attack aircraft, the hell divers and the corsairs, one shot and that's it. Once they've conducted their attack, it's back to the carrier, you need to recycle a fresh squadron. So in that respect, they're a bit more like the Russian aircraft carriers, where any aircraft that you shoot down does actually make a difference, because they don't get to go around again and come at you from the other side. They get one attack. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to Taran later. Let's go and have a look at a proper ship. Let's see Theseus in the Atigo. So, while Taran has been busy 
spotting the entire enemy team without losing a single aircraft, Theseus over here in the Atago has been taking advantage of the spotting, particularly the Kagero. you got to wonder sometimes what these destroyer players are doing. I mean, you know you're spotted, right? Why would you come out from behind cover to get shot at? Well, Theseus is not something out, but the Kagero did go undetected. I mean, he almost certainly popped out there in order to get some torpedoes away. But for now, the next... Well, the only real target he can actually hit from here is, of course, the enemy Ismail. Now, the Atago has 10 8-inch guns, and the high explosive shells are fairly spicy. And that first salvo has set a fire. However, if you look at the top right corner of the screen, you'll see that the damage number isn't ticking up, which means that Ismail has just extinguished a single fire. And he's still getting shot at. Which means he can expect to have another one, and in theory, not be able to do anything about it. You see, in general, battleships who use their damage control to take care of a single damage over time effect, whether that be a flood or a fire, unless they know they're not going to immediately get set on fire or get flooded again, it's usually a very bad idea. But the Ismail, and there's the second fire, is a Russian battleship, and their damage control works differently. Instead of the regular damage control teams that everybody else gets, the Russian battleships get what are known as fast damage control parties. Did you see the fire going out? That was like, what, 20, 30 seconds after the first fire had been set? You see, unlike the damage control teams of battleships of other nations, which in theory have technically unlimited uses, but thanks to the long cooldown, realistically, you can probably only use them something like 10, 11, 12 times during the course of a 20 minute battle, the Russians get a limited number of charges of damage control. I believe it starts at four, but there are various different skills you can apply to your captain that will give you additional charges. But they have an extremely short cooldown, which is why the Ismail was able to extinguish the initial fire, and then what amounted to, to all practical intents and purposes, basically immediately afterwards, extinguish the second fire as well. The thing is, you can't keep doing that throughout the course of the whole battle. I mean, this battle has just started, although two members of Theseus's team have already been sunk, but aside from that, this battle has just started, and the Ismail's probably already blown through half of his damage control charges. I sure hope that doesn't come back to bite him in the arse later. Let's have a quick talk about the Atago, which seems appropriate. It's the ship that Theseus is sailing, after all. This was, I mean, technically the first... It's been around a long, long time. This was technically the first Tier 8 Premium introduced into the game. I say technically because it did replace the Kitakami. Wait, so how can the Atago have been the first Tier 8 Premium if it replaced a Tier 8 Premium? Y yeah, that's why I say technically. The thing is, the Kitakami that it replaced... The Kitakami was hilarious, by the way. And also really, really bad. It was basically a Tier 4 Kuma light cruiser at tier 8, with 40 torpedoes. <laughs> and it was exactly as ridiculous and as dangerous to your own team as it sounds. Fortunately, Wargaming did realise just how crackpot this ship was, but this ship was only available during the closed beta. And so when the game actually went live, the Atago replaced it and became the first tier 8 premium to be available in the game. But it's been around donkey's ears. And you know what? It's still good. Oh no, there am torpedoes. Whatever shall we do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to come back to this cliffhanger uh, after taking a brief look to see exactly what Taran is up to because things are about to get interesting on his side of the map as well. It's at about this point where Taran first gets his name on the scoreboard courtesy of his Douglas Sky Raider torpedo bombers. You can see the size of the torpedoes that these things carry. Each Squadron attacks in flights of two, each aircraft has two torpedoes. They don't do a huge amount of damage because air launch torpedoes couldn't be as big as ship launch torpedoes, because if they were, the aircraft wouldn't be able to get off the deck. Those buggers are heavy. He scores a couple of torpedo hits, but it's not him doing the heavy lifting here as far as this Italian battleship is concerned, as this armor-piercing salvo comes in from the other side of the map. Bitch slaps the Andrea Doria, Italy, I know, I'm sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that almost into the middle of next week, leaving the torpedoes to finish him off. And that's Taran's first kill. 
He's still got one attack flight ready to go, so that's four torpedoes, and there's a Trento over there. I mean, why not? Who cares about Italian AA? <laughs> so, sure. Drops the torpedoes. Maybe they'll hit. Maybe they won't. Doesn't really matter. Because he's already got a full squadron of exactly the same aircraft ready to go again. And sure enough, cap circle defended, three torpedo hits and a flood. Now, one of the reasons, and there were a lot of reasons for the aircraft carrier rework, and even though we complain about carriers, something did need to be done. But one of the things that they wanted to prevent from happening was the ability to do what they called a cross drop on an enemy ship. Because under the old aircraft carrier rules, where you were performing a sort of top-down RTS game, you could control multiple squadrons at once. And if you had a carrier with the squadrons for it, i.e. multiple torpedo attack plane squadrons, it was possible to send two squadrons after one target, have them approach that target from 90 degree angles to each other at the same time, and lay down basically a completely undodgeable pattern of torpedoes. This was known as a cross drop. It didn't matter which way you turned, you were going to be running into a set of torpedoes into the side of your ship. So one of the things, as his aircraft pushed right through the combined and concentrated anti-aircraft fire of two US Navy warships, the Baltimore back there and the Kansas, that he's launching his torpedo attacks on, but one of the things that the aircraft carrier rework was supposed to prevent was the ability of an aircraft carrier to conduct one of these cross drops. Huh. But what about those Kagero torpedoes? Well, first of all, Theseus had his hydro running, so he saw them coming, with plenty of time to manoeuvre to avoid them. And second, well, the Kagero kind of launched them from too far away to hit, well, anything. So he didn't even really need to manoeuvre to avoid them, they were never going to hit him anyway. Although the friendly submarine would have done well to avoid the depth charges dropped by the enemy Amagi. Putting the enemy team not quite 100 points ahead, but the enemy Kagero has been spotted. And like every good cruiser player should, especially if they have the high explosive loaded, and especially if it's 8-inch high explosive, comes to the assistance of the friendly Kagero. Lands a good hit on the enemy ship, and then, well, this is where things start going badly. First he takes an almighty bitch-slapping, I believe, from the Ismail. Then there's a sort of points-neutral exchange as the enemy Rook torpedoes the friendly Sinop and then dies to the shells that the Sinop had in the air. Fortunately, and... Unusually for a tier 8 cruiser, the Atago does have a damage repair party, so he instantly uses that. Even more unfortunately, the team just lose a cruiser, the Oshakov. The enemy team are now 200 points ahead, and they're taking a second cap circle. And the Kagger over there still isn't quite dead. And then with the shots in the air, the friendly Kagger goes down, and of course he was the one spotting the enemy Kagger, so he goes undetected. They're now down six kills to three, with the enemy team flipping a second cap circle. And here come the dive bombers from the enemy carrier, the San Zhang. They were going to hit the Kagero, but well, the Kagero's dead anyway, so hell, why not? The principal threat here, of course, is not the dive bombers. It's the spotting that the dive bombers are doing. In particular for the Kansas, but let's not forget there's an Ismail down there as well. So he fortunately is able to once again go undetected in time to clear this island and also present some kind of armor facing towards those two very upset enemy battleships down there. Let's also not forget that the Kagero did manage to get away alive. So the closer he gets to those battleships, well the second he gets within shooting range of the battleships they're going to spot him of course. But that means the Kagero now has a fresh target to launch torpedoes at. Now, fortunately, the Atago, I mean, even though this is one of the oldest premiums to be in the game, it's still a pretty good ship. It's fast. It's reasonably well armoured on cruiser standards. It has a lot of firepower, 10 8-inch guns. It has four torpedo launchers, two on each side, although the firing angles are pretty terrible. It has a heel. It has spotting aircraft. And it has hydro. There's another exchange of kills there, as the Kansas kills the friendly Harlem, although falling victim to the fires that the Harlem had set just about immediately afterwards. But right now, there are only five of them left, against eight enemies. And those eight enemies control two of the cap circles, and they're busy flipping the only cap circle that's been in the possession of Theseus's team this entire game. 
Now he's kind of spoilt for choice with targets here. He decides he's going to go for the carrier because, well, he is male, he's about to get into cover behind the island and he's got more chance of actually doing some damage to the carrier. Ooh, the carrier just took a big hit there from something. Now Theseus is very aware of the fact that the Kagero is still out there somewhere. He is spotted. Theseus, that is, not the Kagero. And the Kagero's torpedoes are probably reloaded by now. And sure enough, there they are. This is, of course, why he's running his hydroacoustic search. And that's an extremely suspicious looking smoke screen. And he is unfortunately going to eat one of those torpedoes. We'll come back to Theseus in a moment. For now it's back to Taran in the Yorktown, who had been using his aircraft to try to spot that Kagero for his teammate Theseus in the Attica. But he's now given that up for a bad idea. Uh, particularly since Theseus has now just spotted the um, torpedoes and the very suspicious smoke screen hugging the map border and knows exactly where the Kagero is. So with that situation, I'm not going to say under control, but certainly in hand. One of the other things, by the way, that the aircraft carrier rework was supposed to fix was the ability for aircraft carriers to snipe each other. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Stick a pin in that one, we'll come back to it. Theseus has just found himself a Kagero, and he's on fire. And his damage control's on cooldown. Honestly, I mean, he gets the Kagero, and with the Kagero dead, he's no longer spotted. I think he was a little bit... a little bit aggressive in the use of the damage control when he ate the torpedo, because he activated the damage control so quickly, I didn't even get the chance to see whether or not a flood had been caused. But he's definitely on fire and he's definitely burning and there's definitely nothing you can do about it because the damage control is on cooldown. The good news is he's able to get some shots out at the Ismail while remaining undetected because the Ismail doesn't have a direct line of sight to him and sets a fire. A fire which, let's have a look at the damage counter, the Ismail, another single fire that the Ismail has extinguished. He has limited charges of his damage control remember, we know he's used at least two I sure hope that doesn't come back to bite him in the arse. Meanwhile, Taran in the Yorktown has another full squadron of Douglas Sky Raider torpedo bombers, although to be fair he hasn't been cycling torpedo bomber squadrons back to back. The last squadron he launched were the Hell Divers, uh, conducting a very successful 10,000 damage dive bomber attack on the enemy carrier. And he's back because he's thirsty for more. Remember, each two aircraft element the strike package launches four torpedoes. They don't do a huge amount of damage, but when the carrier gets bitch slapped like that from, unless I'm very much mistaken, Theseus, um, those four torpedoes are going to be enough. Let's not celebrate too quickly, however, because the team have just lost a battleship. The Renown has gone down in a vain attempt to defend Cap Circle, Charlie. The only one of the four cap circles in this map that is not already dominated by the enemy team. Taran figures, screw it, I've got the aircraft and the Ismail's just there, I may as well launch a couple more attacks and of course the Ismail's AA is, well it's not good enough. I mean, he shoots an aircraft down but you'll note that they always shoot down the aircraft that aren't actually conducting the next attack. <laughs> so it didn't make any difference. And Taran doesn't even aim these torpedoes, he just dumps them into the water and then immediately launches another squadron. And guess what? Yeah, torpedo hits. Meanwhile, as the friendly Fuso manages to claim a kill, again, along with the Renown who died earlier, trying to defend that cap circle as Charlie, Theseus gets another fire on the Ismail, right before the Ismail is able to sail into cover behind the island. Gee, it sure would be a shame if that Ismail had burned all of his limited damage control charges extinguishing single fires and floods that he didn't need to earlier on in the battle. I told you that one was going to come back and bite him in the arse. Unfortunately, despite the Fuso's valiant last stand over there, and he does manage to take the Trento out before succumbing to the inevitable because he's surrounded, outnumbered, out of friends, and dead. That does, however... Despite the fact that the enemy team have three of the four cap circles and there's now nothing to stop them from taking the fourth, and they are more than 200 points ahead, it's now a three on three. Remember, it wasn't that long ago, it was five against nine. More importantly, only one of these teams has an aircraft carrier, and it's not them. Here's the thing, and this is one of the reasons why I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to call this one an episode of A Game of Thrones, because while all of the ingredients are there, 
In the length of time it's taken me to say that, the enemy team are now 300 points ahead. Because they've got three cap circles, and Theseus' team have none. This is usually the point where the best thing to do would be to run away, stay alive, not lose any more ships, and hold on to that point's lead. But, there are a couple of things working against the enemy team here. First, there's still six minutes of this battle left. That's a long time for Theseus' team to flip some caps. And two, they can't hide. Theseus' team have an aircraft carrier. Oh, Theseus, that's an uncomfortable amount of broadside you're showing there in order to take advantage of those horrible torpedo firing angles. Eh, don't worry, it's fine. He was timing the Wichita's reload. He knows what he's doing. Of course, it would be nice if there was some way his teammates could help him beyond just spotting the targets for him. Oh, Taron. <laughs> because there is literally no end to the USS Yorktown's talents. Where is this smoke screen coming from? The Attico doesn't also get a smoke screen generator, does it? No, of course it doesn't. But the Yorktown does. You see, the two tactical squadrons on the Yorktown, not the Sky Raiders, not the torpedo attack planes, but the Helldivers and the Corsairs, they have a unique consumable. Yes, that's right, aircraft carriers have smoke screen generators now, because why should destroyers and certain cruisers have all the fun? And here it is in action. It's not the same as the smoke generator that you get on destroyers and certain extremely lucky cruisers. Uh, it's more of a smoke curtain than, well, I suppose that does exactly fit the definition of a smoke screen. Let's take a look. Yep, there it is. A smoke screen. Because why the hell not? I mean, it was largely a waste of time anyway because the Wichita has radar, so he's not fooled by the smoke screen. And, uh, yeah, that could have been a lot worse. He's able to get some decent angling going and takes minimal amount. I don't know if you've noticed some of the ricochets. You're actually able to visually see them. There have been a couple of instances in this battle where armor-piercing shells have just bounced right off the Antigo's armor, and you can actually see it happening. Looks like the Wichita's had enough of that shit. He's switching to high explosive. But, uh, I mean, the smoke screen, and... I mean, I don't know if the Wichita's radar had expired or whether or not Theseus is now just outside of... Uh, radar range, but he can't see Theseus anymore thanks to that strategically placed smoke screen. But thanks to the spotting from Taran's Yorktown, he can still see them, and he can still keep shooting at them. An extremely awkward firing angles or not, once he got those torpedoes away, he's taken out the mines. Uh, the Wichita's still there and can now see him, and has switched over to high explosive. Again, Theseus is really quick on the damage control, too quick for his own good. He didn't actually get set on fire there, although he's on fire now, and he used the damage control to repair one of his five gun turrets. And of course, now it's on cooldown, and he has to deal with a full duration fire. Although the good news is he's not a battleship, so it's not going to burn for 60 seconds, but it's still damage that he could have done without. And which if he hadn't been so quick on the trigger, because he did it earlier, controlling a... Well, we didn't even see if there was a flood from the torpedo that he ate from the Kagero, because he used the damage control so quickly. Meanwhile, in other news, the third member of the division, because there is actually a third member of this division, the North Carolina takes out the fleeing Amagi, who looked like he was trying to run away and win on points by staying alive, because at that point they were nearly 500 points ahead, the enemy team that is, obviously not Theseus' team, but it looks like he couldn't resist taking a parting shot at either the carrier or the North Carolina and giving his position away. And that got him sunk, leaving just the Wichita. I mean, it's still 400 points ahead, but he's left it way too little and way too late to try to run away and run the timer down on this match. To be fair to the Wichita, I mean, that was always going to be a tough thing to do because Theseus' team still have a carrier. But the further the distance you've put between yourself and the carrier, the harder it is for the carrier oof, to do things like that. Certainly can't do it as often. And while you still have to worry about getting shot at by the Atago and the North Carolina because the carrier is spotting for them, putting as much distance as possible between yourself and anybody shooting at you or attempting to spot you, especially on a map like this where there's all sorts of island cover, well, the greater your chances of staying alive. 
and you massively increase your chances of being able to string things out long enough to maybe reach a thousand points and win that way or just run the timer down and win by being ahead on points. And any one of the last three enemy ships could have done that if they'd done it two or three minutes ago instead of continuing to try to fight it out. The mines ate a bunch of torpedoes. The Amagi looked like he was trying to do it but he just couldn't resist taking that one final pot shot at the North Carolina, revealing his position to him and being sunk by him. And as for the Wichita, I'm fairly sure that he realised he'd already thrown his 500 point lead and instead just focused on padding his stats, taking that final cap circle for all the good that it did the team and earning himself a little bit of extra XP, well actually quite a large amount of extra XP and credits by taking that final cap circle because taking cap circles is very, very profitable. The thing is, the only thing he achieved by it was making himself the best loser. And that is why I decided that this was worthy of being included in an episode of A Game of Throws. Hope you all enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.